Hi, I'm Pastor Dennis Plant, Principal of Vision Colleges, the best Bible college on or off the internet. But don't just take my word for it. Go for yourself to have a look, visioncolleges.edu.au. There you'll find the most dynamic set of Bible college studies that are available anywhere in the world. You'll find that we take pride in tailoring the programs to meet the students' needs, because you know, every single one of us is different. We all have different needs. We're in a different place in our walk with Jesus. We have different ministries. So the things we need to study vary from person to person. And that's how we can help you. We're not peas in a pod. We're individuals. So we need to study subjects that suit our needs. So once again, go to the site, visioncolleges.edu.au or send me an email, principal at visioncolleges.edu.au. I'd love to chat with you, discuss how we can help you to do the studies that you need to meet the needs of your ministry. Right now, I'd like to take a little time just to share with you about our latest topic, which is knowing God's voice, how God speaks to man. And there are very many ways that God has spoken with men over the years. The problem is we sometimes try and fit everything that's like one box fits all and it just doesn't work that way. But I'm only going to be able to skim the subject, so I'd like you to get onto the site Get a copy of the book, Knowing God's Voice. It's by Harvest Time International. It's a great topic and you'll get so much more out of it. Whether you get the book as a personal study or whether you get it as a Bible college student, that's for you to decide. But right now, I want to take you on a journey about learning God's voice. It is important to understand how God speaks to us because he does. He speaks to us through his word and through very many other methods. And if we're going to be able to follow the Lord and do the things he wants us to do, if we're going to grow in grace, then we need to understand that we need to hear him as he speaks in the various different ways that he does. God is not limited, as you're going to see. But to start with, we need to see this. Be not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How are you going to do that? if you don't hear God speaking to you in, you know, we use this term, hear God speak, and it's not always audible, and sometimes that term gets overused, but there are different ways that God communicates with us. And the Bible is full of examples of God communicating with man in different ways, using different methods, and we need to see that because God does not use one particular way with anyone, but you as an individual are going to find God communicating with you in many different ways. And we're going to see that unfold as we go through this study. We should be able to anticipate this one, that God is going to communicate with us through the written word, that is through the Bible. And indeed, that is the primary method of God speaking to us. Not only that, but what you'll see is that when God speaks to you through any other method, the way of determining the validity of this word is through the written word. Now, it's also important to realize something else, that God will speak to you primarily through his word, through the Bible. And anything else that God has to say above and beyond what is in the Bible, that is in personal direction, is going to conform to the Bible. But if you don't, if you're not prepared to read what the Word of God has to say in the Bible, don't expect to hear from God any other way, because this is the primary means by which God is going to speak to you. He's spoken to his people through the written word down through the centuries. And we need to, first of all, accept that as the primary method. So thou shalt not steal or you shall not steal don't commit adultery, that we should be good to one another, that we should treat one another with great respect, and so on and so forth, all of those things. And there's very specifics about how we should treat ourselves, that we should see ourselves as the temple of the Holy Spirit. See, a great deal of what God has to say to you and to me is already established in the Bible. So if you're not going to read it, 
you're not going to hear it. And here's the other side of it too, that if you don't read the Bible, how are you going to be able to measure those other forms of communication as to being or not being the Word of God? How will you know whether or not you're being deceived if you don't take time to read what the Word of God has to say to you, about you, about me, about everything else in the first place? So the Word is first and primary. Now, the second way that God is going to speak to us is through prayer. And the amazing thing is the number of times that God has spoken or determined his will as a matter of answering prayer. Now, certainly there are many biblical examples of God speaking to us as a result of prayer. Here's, here's one. They would fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them and said that this is talking about uh, the ministry of Paul and Barnabas, that they weren't prepared to send them away without having prayed and getting a sense from the Spirit of God that this was what God wanted to do. But not just that. Have a look at this. After they fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is to include the request of fulfillment of God's will on earth. Your will be done. We're asking God to fulfill his will on earth as it is in heaven. It's a prayerful process. And as we pray that, God begins to work in us his will on earth as it is in heaven. Whoops, sorry about that. Jesus prayed for direction before he selected the disciples. It came to pass in those days he went into a mountain to pray, continued all night in prayer, and when it was day he called to himself the disciples, and of them he chose the twelve, of whom he named the apostles. Jesus did not determine who the twelve apostles were going to be as a matter of his own decision. He took time with God to find out what God wanted. And then, once he knew what God wanted to do, then he called the disciples and he named them apostles. Okay, so, you know, when we're making decisions, when we need to understand something that's just a little bit beyond our reach, we need to learn to take time to pray and say, Lord, what do you want me to do in this circumstance? And God will lead you into that, just the same as he did for Paul and Barnabas, the same as he did for Jesus, the same as he did for Paul and his own, the same as he did for Peter, and so many others. God will lead you if you take the time to pray. But the trick is, you've got to be willing to take the time to pray. Now, another option that God uses many times to help us understand his will is the use of counsellors. Now, that shouldn't be surprising because even in our secular work, we know that the advice that comes from a group of wise people help us, no matter what the task may be, whether we're learning to be a nurse or a doctor or work in a, in a retail outlet or whether we're being a pastor of a church or whatever it might be, we need to get the advice of counsellors and of advisors. But call them what you may. It's all very, very similar. And, you know, the thing is, where no counsel is, the people fail. But in the multitude of counsellors, there is safety. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkens to the counsel is wise. God gives counselors wisdom. God doesn't give everybody wisdom. God doesn't make everybody wise. We know that just by looking around us into our community, into our churches, into our business, into our schools. Not everybody's wise. But God does work through wise people and gives good counsel. And you and I need to learn to listen to godly, wise people if we want to do the things that God wants us to do. Pretty simple, really, when you think about it. Another option that God uses to speak to his people is through circumstances. Now, here's one thing. Every single one of us have circumstances. And we've all known that circumstances may or may not be good. But God will use circumstances to show us his will one way or another. And that's something which is demonstrated over and over again throughout the Bible. You may be in a particular circumstance, 
But I want to tell you, God will use that circumstance that you're in to determine his will for you and very often the welfare of others. One of the great examples of circumstance really is with Joseph way back in the Old Testament. God used his circumstances to save two nations and many other people. God wanted Joseph to be in Egypt. Well, Joseph wasn't going to get up and pack his bags and go to Egypt. Now, there's a whole lot of stuff around there which you can read in Genesis chapter 37 through 50. But here's the thing. It was necessary in order to get Joseph to Egypt so God had, well, we say God had, so the point is that uh, Joseph's sons were very jealous. They captured Joseph, they captured their brother, they bound him up, they sold him to some slavers who sent him to Egypt. He ends up in the uh, emperor's home where he's going to eventually, through a whole series of circumstances, get the eye of the pharaoh. And here in Egypt, he's going to become second in charge of the nation. A great famine is to come. Dreams are given. Joseph is given the interpretation of that dream and shows the pharaoh how the nation of uh, Egypt can be saved. In the process of saving the nation of Egypt, Israel has sent to Egypt and there they re-establish relationship between the brothers and Joseph. As a consequence of that, the nation of Israel, the nation of Egypt is saved. There is food to last through the famine and everybody is, is treated well as a result of that. There's a whole lot more to the story, of course. The point is this, though that God uses sometimes the most awful circumstances that we're in. Like with Noah, Noah, sorry, not Noah, um, Jonah. Jonah is, uh, he, he tries to avoid going to Nineveh, but God wants Jonah to go to Nineveh. And he refuses to go. He'll do everything except go to Nineveh. So eventually he ends up in the belly of a whale, metaphorically speaking. And from there, he is disgorged onto the shores of Nineveh, where he preaches and the nation is saved, at least for a time. Circumstances are used by God to help us fulfill God's will, whether we're willing or unwilling. Here's the point, though. You can cooperate with those circumstances and God's will, all those circumstances can be used to drag you kicking and screaming into God's plan. Of course, Paul was one who very often experienced circumstances that many of us would turn from, but Paul knew to look through the circumstance and find God's will and cooperate with God's will. As a result of that, he brought to us a particular truth that many people take without appreciating the experience that came behind it. As Paul wrote, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. See, the thing is, you might find yourself in dire straits. You might find yourself struggling with something, but if you will learn to listen to the Spirit of God in that circumstance, you will find a release of the anguish and a blessing that you did not anticipate that will come your way. The circumstances that you are in are known of God, and he will use those circumstances for your blessing. Now here's another one which we, we tend to ignore a little bit. That's open and closed doors. Sometimes God shuts doors and sometimes he opens doors. But we need to understand what is happening. Those circumstances are a circumstance of blessing. If you will receive it, if you will hear it, if you will understand it, God knows how to turn your situation into your blessing. Now, Paul recognized what was going on here. The circumstances of life in Paul had resulted in what he called open and closed doors. 
he wrote to the Corinthians, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual one is open to me. There are many adversaries. An open door of blessing doesn't mean you're not going to have a hard time, because sometimes you will. Sometimes it will be a very hard time. There's a foolish doctrine that says if everything is going well, it must be God's will. Fact is, if everything is going well, it probably isn't God's will. But just because things are going well doesn't mean it's not God's will, if you can follow the logic of all of that. I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effectual door is open to me. The heart of Paul is to preach the gospel. That's what he wants to do. That's, that's what he aches to do. And here at Ephesus, a door of opportunity has opened, and so he isn't able to go where he would like to go at this time. And sometimes we have to recognize that God is restraining us from going where we want to go. On another occasion, he records his desire to minister in some areas. Now they'd gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia. They were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they would come to Mysia, they are said to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. In other words, while on one hand God opened a door in Ephesus, on the other hand God closed the door for them to go to other places. So we need to understand this concept of open and closed doors or the ability to go somewhere that we want to go may or may not occur, but God has the capacity to bring blessing to you and to speak to you if you will listen at that time. And of course, that's going to bring us to another topic, and that is angels. God speaks to us through angels. Did you know that angels are sent to us as ministering spirits? To every single Christian, everywhere, angels are bound, and they are bound in our life to help us, to direct us, to change our circumstances, sometimes to bring about the miraculous, sometimes to just save our lives, sometimes to bring wisdom and understanding. What is an angel? An angel is simply a messenger of God. And there are many different examples of such. They are not necessarily huge beings in a white glowing robe and majestic wings. Indeed, they're most likely not like that. But they're sent by God, no matter what form they may take. I have in my own life experienced many strange and wondrous opportunities where angels have intervened for me. And that's true of every single Christian. That person that comes along and speaks the right word at the right time, at the right moment that you've never met. I remember one particular occasion when an angel came in a form of an animal. As I was working, uh, I would arrive home very late one night and I was working, uh, or rather living, in Bankstown. And as I was uh, walking home through some very dangerous areas, for several weeks, a dog would come up alongside me. It would take my hand between its teeth. If I tried to withdraw my hand, then he would tighten his grip, but never pierce the skin, never hurt me. And he would walk with me for over a kilometer, walking me through these very dangerous streets, and no one would dare come near as they saw this man with this alsatian. For several weeks that occurred on a daily basis. I know that the author of, the, of many, many of our subjects, Ken Chant, speaks of an occasion when he was on a beach. He'd swum out and got caught in a rip and was drowning. And then someone suddenly came to save him. He was dragged, exhausted to the beach. And when he looked up, there was no one there. The interesting thing was that it was a deserted beach and there was only one set of footprints and that was Ken's own set of footprints into the beach from that tiny little cove where he'd gone. And yet someone had come to rescue him. Ken's footprints to the beach, no other footprints coming to the beach or leaving, but that person had rescued Ken. And I know that there are many, many other stories. I could regale you with stories of angels, but you've had people stepping into your life. You've had circumstances stepping into your life 
an angel and God has intervened. Well, that brings us to something else. Miracles. God speaks to us through the miraculous so many times in so many ways and it is glorious and wondrous when he does so. I'm sure that many of you are very aware of the many miracles of Jesus when he cleansed a woman who was who had been 12 years having a blood issue literally having her periods for 12 years bleeding to death slowly and in an instant he heals her the time when he reached out and caused the fish to come into the net as he was getting the attention of Peter James and John of the times that he walked on water of the time that he fed the multitude with a few loaves and fish and way back in the Old Testament, the time with the prophet, when the, when, uh, the prophet was challenged and he called the, 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 the prophets of Baal and set them aside and said, OK, let's prove who God really is. We'll have this great big altar here and we'll put the wood on the altar and uh, we'll, we won't light this wood ourselves. We'll call on God and the God who answers by fire, he is God. The prophets of Baal cried from dawn till dusk, cutting themselves, wailing, bewailing, weeping, shouting, screaming. Baal did not answer them a word, not a single peep, nothing. One particular place, the prophet turns to them and the literal Greek says, uh, sorry, the literal, the literal Hebrew says to them, uh, the, the, the prophet said to them, maybe you should cry louder, perhaps he's on the toilet. <laughs> Well, moving on from there, at sun sunset, there's no response from Baal. And so Elijah calls. And before he does, he says, get some barrels of water and drench the bonfire, drench the, the wood, and drench the wood until we've filled a trench around the altar. And then he cries, God, our Father, light the fire. And fire came from heaven and burnt up the wood, burnt up the water, turned the water into steam. And the people said, the Lord, he is God. They realized that Jehovah really was God. Sometimes God speaks to us through circumstances that we find. We need to respond to circumstances, to miracles. Throughout the birth of the nation of Israel, they had seen God working. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them in the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and by night. He took them. He took not the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. God has always worked in miracles. There's this tremendous capacity that we have to put down the supernatural and call it a coincidence. These things are not coincidence. This is an act of God. We need to recognize it. We need to understand it. God speaks to you through miracles. Of course, that brings us to dreams. God speaks to us through dreams. Remember when Joseph was uh, still betrothed to Mary, he found out that his bride-to-be was pregnant. He was willing to put her away. He was a, a good man, but he didn't want his bride to be embarrassed. There's a whole lot of stuff in there that we don't have time to go into. So what Joseph does is sleeps on the matter. And while he sleeps, an angel speaks to him and says, don't be afraid, Joseph. This child of Mary is begotten of God and you don't need to be afraid. Joseph received that and heard it, but it wasn't just that. Later, remember that Pilate and the king were prepared to kill the baby Jesus, and the king sent out his army to kill every child two years of age and under. But before that could happen, God spoke to Joseph in a dream and said, get yourself up and move this child to Egypt until I tell you otherwise. And he spoke to the three wise men or the wise men, we don't know how many there were. He spoke to the wise men and said, don't go back the same way, go back another way, avoid the king. 
God speaks to us through dreams. Not ordinary dreams. Those dreams that God uses to speak to us stand out. We can't get rid of them. We can't shake them. And I remember in, very early in my experience, I had a dream and God spoke to me and introduced me to the person in a dream that was going to ultimately lead me to Christ, although I had no concept of that at the time. Not a clue, no idea. But God used a dream to bring me into his kingdom. He's used dreams since then and will continue till I'm sure. Not every dream is of God, but the ones that are from God are very clear to understand. But if there are dreams, there's something else also that we need to be concerned with. And those are visions. For you see, not only does God speak through dreams, he speaks through visions. What's the difference between a dream and a vision, you may well ask. Well, the difference is that a vision is something you see with your spiritual eyes, not your natural eyes, so to speak. It's not something you see while you're asleep. It's something you usually see whilst you're awake. And it's something that is absolute. It, it, in a sense, it seems like a dream, but it isn't. It's a dream, if you like, while you're awake. That's a good way to try and describe it, but it's difficult to explain in any other terms. But God speaks through us through visions and he's done it down through the centuries for so many people. Here's a few examples. God appeared to Abraham in a vision and made him a great promise in Genesis 15 that he was going to be the father of a great nation and indeed he was. The book of Daniel is filled with dreams and visions. These are used to reveal many things about the future of the world and indeed the world as it is today can be found very easily in the book of Daniel. God gave Peter a vision concerning the need to take the gospel to the Gentile nations, and you'll find that in Acts chapter 10. God called Paul to Macedonia through a vision in Acts chapter 16, and he spoke to Paul in a night vision, Acts chapter 18. And finally, of course, the, book of, the last book of the Bible is a book of visions, and well, not so much dreams, but certainly a book of visions as seen by the Apostle John. We need to understand that there are so many ways that God can speak to you and to me. I have but skimmed the surface and rather quickly because I needed to get hold of the book, knowing God's voice through harvest time. There's some wonderful material in there. Like I said, I've skimmed it. You need to get the book. Whether you get it as a hard copy or as a PDF, whether you get it as a subject or whether you get it as just a reading material, that is up to you. But I encourage you to get it anyway so that you can get a better idea of how God can speak to you because there is still one more way that God is going to speak to us that we have not touched upon at this time. And that is the audible voice of God. But that and the voice of God is for next time because frankly we've run out of time trying to deal with this subject and it is an important subject and of course it's important because as I say so very many times to each and every one of you it's important because you matter and it matters that you know how to hear the voice of God the word of God the way God communicates with you but that has to begin with this single thought that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You have to begin by believing he is there. If you don't believe that God is real how are you going to hear his voice? You need to be prepared to believe if you don't believe. You need to be say well I'm going to have an open mind. If God is real Talk to me somehow in a way that I will recognize that it was you. And I want to assure you of something. God will indeed do that. Well, I'm Pastor Dennis Plant with Vision Colleges. I want to encourage you to check out our website, visioncolleges.edu.au, or email me, principal, at visioncolleges.edu.au. And remember that we've been studying this subject, which is knowing God's voice and how God speaks to man, part one. And next time, it will be how God speaks to man, part two. But 
in the meantime, I just pray that God is going to bless you real good. Lord bless you.